Hello and welcome again to another um, OpenShift Commons briefing. Today is part of a series of um, operator hours and um, the fo good folks from Crunchy Data have long, for a long time done great work uh, around the operator pattern and um, today we have Jonathan Katz here with us um, to talk about the high availability Postgres um, and a whole lot more on OpenShift and we are going to have um, him do a, an overview of, of the topic and hopefully a little bit of a live demo because we'll put him on the spot and live Q&A. So if you're wherever you are, whether you're in Twitch or YouTube or Facebook or here in Blue Jeans, ask your questions in the chat and we'll relay them to him and have a conversation at the end about you know, the future of Postgres SQL and all kinds of good things. So, Jonathan, take it away, um, introduce yourself, and um, let's learn a lot more. Thank you. Sure. Thank, thank, thanks, Diane. Yeah. So, yeah, very happy to be here. It's, uh, you know, it's been a while since uh, I've been participating in an OpenShift Commons. You know, I'm looking forward to the point where we can all get together again in person. So, uh, just real quick, uh, a little bit about Crunchy Data. Uh, all we do is Postgres and all we do is open source. Uh, you know, very similar to, to Red Hat's model. Uh, you know, we started historically focusing on how to securely deploy, deploy Postgres, uh, which is, you know, very important in, you know, many enterprise environments. And then, you know, as, you know, containers became a big deal and as Kubernetes and OpenShift became a big deal, we focused on how to deploy Postgres in those types of environments, which is a lot of what we're going to talk about today. And like I said, you know, everything we do is open source. You know, everything I'm going to demo today, talk about today is open source. You know, we believe, you know, the best Postgres solution is, you know, the upstream solution. So, all, you know, everything we try to do, you know, we, you know, we give back to the community in that regard. So, yeah, you know, feel free to, you know, ask questions throughout. You know, I, I'm very active in the Postgres community. Actually, I have a slide on that. Um, I've actually been, I've been using Postgres for about 15 years. Um, I've been active in the community for about 10, uh, actually a little bit over 10 now, uh, mainly focused on advocacy. Uh, so for instance, we have the Postgres 13 major release coming out next week, and a lot of what I do is, you know, geared towards, you know, getting that release out the door. Um, you know, before I joined Crunchy Data, uh, I was involved in a, you know, a few different startups in New York City. And of course, we use Postgres as the solution there, but my background is actually in application development, and I think, you know, some of the things we'll talk about today will reflect that. And, you know, for me, you know, it was sort of my journey from application developer to understanding more of the systems administration side and, you know, bringing that background of, you know, being always being the accidental systems administrator in, you know, the various organizations I worked for. So, uh, and, you know, you know, beyond, beyond that, um, you know, love, you know, I just love the open source ecosystem in general. You know, I've been very fortunate in my career. I've only, you know, I've been able to use exclusively open source. So, um, it's great to, you know, give back, you know, in a variety of ways. So, you know, you know, maybe to back up a second, you know, if, if we were, well, first off, if we were in a, you know, a, a regular, uh, conference setting, I would normally ask how many people are running Postgres and then how many people are running Postgres in production. But I also like to take a step back and just talk about, you know, what it takes to run a database, you know, in an organization. You know, it's one thing to play around with, you know, a data system on your laptop, do some cool things on it, which, you know, arguably is what I'm going to be doing in the demo today. But there's, you know, more considerations when you're trying to run a database system in production. I mean, it's very similar to what you might do with OpenShift, where, you you know, you have multiple, you know, high availability nodes set up to make sure that if, you know, one goes down, you're able to get your workloads over to another until, you know, the, the original node heals. Um, and, you know, and, you know, and you need to consider this, you know, when you're running Postgres, I mean, or, you know, even any database. I mean, databases are, you know, foundational in applications. They're storing your data. So you need to make sure your data is there, is safe, it's stored securely, and you're able to retrieve it and retrieve it efficiently as well. But, you know, a lot of things can go wrong in production. Um, you know, for instance, your data might become unavailable. There could be a network outage. There could be, you know, a rogue process that's, you know, just sapping all the resources from the system. Um, you know, it could, you know, it could be any combination of things. You know, you know, there are many cases where, you know, I would, you know, commit a denial of service on my own production database. So there's the human error as well. So you want to make sure that your database remains as available to your applications as possible. But, you know, certain, you know, other things can go wrong as well. You know, for instance, let's say I drop the users table, you know, that's going to cause a very bad day. So we need to be able to restore the database, you know, back to the point where the users table existed. Um, beyond that, you know, you might be, you know, using databases in your development environments that you do have one production environment, but, you know, to develop, you want to be, be able to bring up databases for your team. 
so you won't be able to rapidly provision or you know, maybe rapidly destroy. You may also want to be able to create production or production-like data or scenarios for your developers to work through, for instance, to troubleshoot an issue that is in your production environment. So being able to clone and copy that data is you know, very important as well. And of course, if you have you know, various you know, data regulatory concerns, you want to be able to do that in a way that is safe and secure. You want to be able to you know, anticipate problems before they happen. So you want to be able to monitor. You might want to know that, oh, I'm running out of disk. You know, I need to provision. You know, I need to provision more space. I need to resize my you know, PVC or you know, or PV. Um, you know, maybe you know, maybe things are not performing as quickly as they could be. You want to be able to you know, troubleshoot and diagnose which are your slow queries and you know, and try to optimize them. Um, and of course, you need to be able to manage. You know, you know, who's able to access your data. Production, typically it's your applications or, you know, a database administrator who might come in and troubleshoot things. Um, and, you, you know, you also need to make sure you're securing the connections. Or are they over TLS? And, you know, you know, other all the considerations around that. So there's a lot to consider. Um, and, you know, I, you know, I sort of try to layer it that, you know, there's, you know, multiple ways to get there, that you do have your stock Postgres system, but you need to bring in an ecosystem around it. Now, Postgres has a lot of these things available. In terms of you know what's built in into into the core system, and this is you know comes through really over 30 years of evolution of Postgres. Post, you know, I like to joke. Well, it's not really a joke. I'm, you know, I'm about the same age as Postgres. Uh, it's been around. You know, it's been around for a hot minute now, um, and a lot has you know it's it, it has you know adapted and changed with the times. Um, you know, one of the reasons why Postgres has become very popular uh, through the years is because of its license. You know, much like Linux, you know, there's no single vendor. Um, you know, it's a very flexible license. No one can actually own Postgres. And the community has gone to great lengths to make sure, you know, this is the case. Because of this, you know, it actually, you know, it, it's attracted a very healthy ecosystem of people contributing to Postgres. And through this and through reward use cases, you know, it's, you know, recent Postgres releases have brought it to, you know, feature parity with other proprietary databases. So an ex I'll take an example from about 10 years ago, but uh, streaming replication. You know, and streaming replication is one of the foundational aspects for, you know, creating a high availability system that you're able to take your data from your primary server and, you know, and, you know, copy it over, you know, in an ordered fashion to your replica server and in a way that's, you know, fast and efficient. So that came about 10 years ago. And, it, you know, it was, you know, the basic form is basically, you know, as soon as I get the data changes, send it over. I have I've no guarantees if it gets there, but I'm going to try to send it over as fast as I can. Then came synchronous replication, which is geared towards workloads that are, you know, require, you know, that are, are right sensitive. For instance, I really don't want to lose the transaction. I want to make sure it's copied to at least one other place. Uh, that, you know, that came, let's say, you know, roughly nine years ago. And, you know, I could actually probably go into a whole spiel about the difference between these two replication modes, their trade-offs, et cetera. I'll save that for a later slide or perhaps a question. You know, at, you know, and, you know, as Postgres evolved, you know, further things were added. Uh, suddenly you had cascading replication where you could have a replica of a replica, which allows you to, you know, push things out, you know, even, you know, you know, to, you know, you know, more distributed environments. And I can actually tell you that the Postgres operator, which we'll talk about, you know, it supports that, you know, supports that feature in one of its uh, architectures. Uh, we, you know, eventually we got uh, something called quorum commit, um, you know, which is popular in the distributed consensus world, where basically you can say, as long as my, you know, my transaction gets to at least, you know, let's say two replicas, then I'm going to consider it written. And if not, you know, I'm going to hold the transaction until I know it's, you know, safely written to, you know, a certain number of replicas. We also got logical replication, which, you know, created, you know, you can create some, you know, really awesome things around that. But one of the important things is being able to online upgrade. So, you know, going from Postgres, let's say, you know, 10 to 12, I can keep my system online and basically, you know, flip it over like that, reducing the amount of downtime that I need. Um, and, you know, and so, and, and that's just one feature, you know, you know, this, you know, replication has been very important to, you know, you know, ensure Postgres can stay available. Now, to properly use it, there's a few, you know, you know, it does take some work to, you know, set things up, you know, similar to writing a, you know, an OpenShift manifest, uh, you know, there, you know, the feature is there, but, you know, you need to be able to fill it all in. And this is where using automation patterns like the operator can help, uh, you know, with that task. The, the other thing is, you know, Postgres, you know, extensibility, you know, beyond just having extensions themselves. And, you know, we're going to talk about those today where, you know, you can basically, you know, add on to Postgres functionality while still maintaining, you know, the open source core. 
Um, there's a whole library ecosystem that makes it, you know, super easy to manage Postgres, you know, be able to, for instance, monitoring it or, you know, you know, handling, you know, the HA in a you know, really cool way. Beyond that, uh, you know, having, you know, transaction safety, data integrity, ensuring that your data gets written to disk, being able to detect if your data is corrupted. Uh, this is the, the page check sum feature in Postgres. Um, you know, it's, you know, it's really made it, you know, very trusted and, the question late, you know, when I first started in the Postgres community, the question I got most often was, what's Postgres? And this was in the tech community that, you know, people didn't really know what it was. And here it had already been around for 20 years. The question I get now is not what's Postgres, but how do I do X, Y, Z with Postgres? How do I deploy it in this manner? How can I use this feature? And, you know, it's really shown the evolution that, you know, not only does, you know, Postgres have, you know, a name recognition, um, it's being deployed. It's being deployed in mission critical ways. And again, with my uh, open source community hat on, like, it's, it's just so cool to, you know, have really seen their evolution. And it really goes to the credit of the community and, you know, the feedback we've been getting into the community to make sure we can continue improving the products. So, um, that is my spiel on Postgres. There, you know, I was joking with Diane that you know I could probably talk about Postgres itself for at least an hour, and uh, there still would be plenty more to talk about. But you know, today, you know, the goal is to talk about how do we run Postgres on you know OpenShift or Kubernetes, and in a way that can satisfy you know all the all the needs you need to be able to run it into production. And this is where operators come in. Uh, operators, you know, have really changed the way in terms of how you can deploy stateful applications on Kubernetes. And what do I mean by that? Stateful workloads really only have one job. You need to maintain state. Basically, if, you know, I modify, you know, let's say I insert a record, let's say it's a financial transaction, I need to make sure it gets written to disk. I need to make sure that, you know, nothing's going to mutate that record in a way where it's going to invalidate the transaction or lose the transaction. I mean, that would be pretty bad. So, we want to make sure that we're able to create a system that's resilient. That let's say, you know, my disk does, you know, crash out or it knows, you know, the block, there's, you know, some corrupt blocks on the PVC I'm using that I'm able to restore my data in a way and know that, you know, I didn't lose any of it. But in order to do that in Kubernetes, you know, we need to apply more knowledge in general. Um, and this is where operators can help because operators can help encode specific information into you know, into your environment so that you're deploying your, you know, you're deploying your stateful service in a way that, you know, matches what it does. So Postgres does things one way. MySQL does things another way. There's, you know, from a high level, they're similar, but the specifics in terms of how they work are different. And that's where the operator can capture that information. Additionally, you know, to modify the state, you know, it could be ranged for something, you know, very simple or very tedious. To create a Postgres replica is actually a little bit of a tedious process. It helps to have all of that automated and it helps to, you know, have that automated in a way that is able to do it efficiently. Um, adding a user, on the other hand, is very simple. You know, I can add a user to a database, you know, with one line of SQL, but let's say I bring a new DBA into the team and I want to give, uh, give them an account, uh, to all the databases. Well, that's a little bit more tedious. And granted, you know, if you've been doing DevOps practices for years, you can, you know, write, you know, your appropriate Ansible playbook to get that all set up. But then you have to think about that from a maintainability perspective, because, you know, you're, you know, you're creating something that may or may not be standard, standard practice, and then you have to teach everyone in terms of how to do that. What operators do is that they create a consistent view of the world so that, you know, adding a user is the same, you know, no matter where you install the operator. And that's where this pattern is great because, you know, with having a healthy operator ecosystem, suddenly, you know, we're able to, you know, create standard ways of, you know, taking actions on the various uh, stateful services that are out there. Um, and, you know, this, this leads to the final point of, you know, allowing automated managed workloads. Um, you know, some of this starts with just being able to do, you know, the proverbial day two operations, handling high availability, having monitoring in place, having, you know, taking systematic backups and so on and so forth. But, as things continue to advance and you know some of this is forward looking um having you know having smart systems and you know some some of these are already and what I mean, what I mean by smart systems i mean you know being able to auto scale or you know auto auto tune themselves and there's some services that can do that and with postgres you know to, to be able to deal with a, a database system like postgres to do things like auto scaling you need to have a lot more knowledge because you know what does that actually mean do i need to scale vertically do i need to add more ram how does that affect my Postgres configuration? 
Or, you know, do I need to load balance things more? Is my workload really read heavy? How do I determine if it's read heavy? How, what are my, what are my scaling th thresholds? And we have the ability to start amassing that information and start building out systems like that. But, you know, that, that'll take some time. That said, you know, with the way the operator pattern works, you know, you know, we're well on our way to getting to that point. So, you know, I would say that concludes my spiel on Kubernetes operators and, you know, tie it into a topic that's near and dear to my heart, which is the Crunchy Postgres operator. So, as I said uh, at the beginning, at Crunchy Data, everything we do is open source, um, and the operator is no exception. Uh, it's actually been open source since March of 2017. Uh, it's, one of, it's one of the early examples of a, a stateful operator. Uh, currently, we're on our version 4.4. Actually, we have a 4.5 in beta right now. I'm going to demo a little bit from that today. This is uh, the surprise demo I was uh, informed about, but, uh, you know, that surprise demos are all the more fun. Uh, it's a, it's level five on uh, Operator Hub. Uh, it's a, a certified operator. Um, you know, you can go ahead, try it out today. And, you know, going back to that original slide, I mean, I do like the hippo wearing the, the coup hat, but the idea with the operator is we want to support all the features you need to run Postgres in production. And it could be a single Postgres, Postgres cluster you're running in production, or it could be, you know, a thousand Postgres clusters being managed by the operator. You know, we've seen both use cases. And of course, everything in between. And to us, you know, it was important that we're able to do that. And, you know, I could go, I can go and read through the list, but I, you know, and I'm, I'm rather I'm going to cover, you know, a couple of things I hadn't touched on yet. Um, elasticity. Being able to add and remove replicas, you know, they could be for high availability purposes. They could be that you need a read only replica. You know, your, your business intelligence person comes in and, you know, wants to perform, you know, some read only queries. Um, and, you know, it could be, you know, it could be for load balancing as well. You know, it, you know, it just depends on what your use case is. But, you know, the idea was to make it easy that I can, you know, add an additional replica just by typing, you know, pigo scale hippo or whatever my cluster is. Uh, leveraging, you know, one thing that's important too is we can leverage, you know, Kubernetes and OpenShift native objects to, you know, create a, you know, a very sound system. So, uh, Kubernetes has this concept of pod anti-affinity where you can assign rules to say, hey, you know, I want pods of these types to ensure that they don't deploy to the same cluster. Uh, you can require it and say, like, don't schedule the pod unless they're specifically deployed to, uh, different nodes. Or you can prefer it and say, you know, try to schedule the pods to different nodes, but if you can't do it, no, it's okay. You know, schedule to the same node. Um, but the reason we, we went with that is to make sure that it's, there's, you know, a higher probability or guaranteed probability that you can schedule your Postgres instances to, to different nodes. Um, a disaster recovery, uh, we use an open source tool, uh, called, uh, PG Backrest. Um, you know, it's actually something that, you know, we support very heavily and, the reason is that it was designed for terabyte scale databases that, you know, they saw, <clears throat> the author saw an issue where it was difficult to create an efficient backup solution in Postgres for, you know, very large databases. And they, they sure, sure enough, they've solved that problem. Um, you know, and, you know, one thing that we've done with the operator is that we built our disaster recovery solution around it. Um, <clears throat> it's great. Um, I, you know, I, you know, it's one thing that, you know, I've always looked to employ, you know, wherever I've been employed, you know, and since the existence of PG Backrest. And, you know, we're very happy to, you know, help try further use cases to it. In fact, you know, one of the benefits of doing everything open source is that, you know, the operator does help, you know, and based upon the feedback we get from the operator, it does help drive features being added to PG Backrest. So one of the big ones was being able to expire backups, you know, or create a time-based retention policy, you know, saying like, hey, I want to keep this full backup for, you know, 21 days. Um, you know, that, you know, came from direct feedback of people using the Postgres operator, and ultimately it was upstreamed into PG Backrest. Administration. Uh, one thing that I may or may not attempt to demo is being able to use the popular PG admin tool, which is a graphical user interface to, uh, administrate, um, the, uh, you know, your Postgres instance. And, uh, PG monitor, which is a connection pooler. Uh, you know, one of the known limitations in Postgres is that, um, the number of connections you have could have an impact on database performance. It has to, it has to be a fairly large number. Uh, that said, um, uh, first off, there's actually a big improvement for that coming in Postgres 14, but, you know, that's at least a year away. And, um, you know, you know, until then, you know, there is PG Balancer, which, uh, is, you know, a connection builder. So basically you could have, a, you know, 
you know, several hundred connections coming into PG Bouncer and then, you know, scale, scale down when it actually goes into Postgres. Uh, I've deployed it, you know, multiple times in my career. Big, you know, I was very happy that, you know, we, we were able to integrate it into the, the Postgres operator. And, you know, there's some other, there's some added benefits of, you know, PG Bouncer as well, where it can do connection state management, where basically during a failover scenario, you can have PG Bouncer, you know, hold connections until the failover is complete and then resume them. Uh, last but not least, and, you know, a big feature for five is a, a full support of the open source PG monitor, which includes, you know, lots of wonderful uh, charts and uh, graphs that are essential for monitoring Postgres clusters, which, you know, we'll touch on in a little bit. So why should we use an operator? Uh, well, there's a lot, there's a lot of, you know, really good points on that. Um, I'll, I'm just going to brush on this slide because I'd rather get into, you know, talking about some of the, uh, the architecture and the, the nitty gritty details of how the Postgres operator works. But, you know, automation standardization, ease of use. Um, you know, I think, you know, I, you know, I tried to discuss this as well as I could before. Um, I do want to emphasize the ease of use. You know, the idea that, you know, we have, you know, a fairly simple API or you can, you know, manipulate things from the CRDs or, you know, even like a CLI UI, you know, our Pico command line interface, you know, is, is very popular because I can just do Pico create cluster hippo. Boom. I have a Postgres cluster. Pico create cluster hippo replica count three. I have, you know, a high availability, uh, 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 cluster there. Um, I've also been involved in developing a UI around the operator and, you know, it's, you know, that, that's a longer story for another day, but, you know, by creating like a standard interface, it's very easy to create, you know, even more, you know, robust applications around Postgres. Um, scale. And when I talk about scale, you know, it's not just saying like, oh, you know, the Postgres operator can manage, you know, a thousand Postgres clusters. It's also scaling your workload. And, you know, this is something I always looked at, you know, when, you know, as an engineering manager is, how do I scale our processes across the team? Can I create something that's repeatable and standard that, you know, everyone can, you know, can uh, be able to do and interface with? So that, um, you know, that's an important thing to consider as well. Um, we certainly don't, you know, engineering type things to ensure the operator itself can scale. Um, for instance, our multi name space support, um, you know, we, at one point we were hitting limitations on it, but, you know, thanks to one of our very smart engineers, you know, we can handle I know easily northward of 100 namespaces in the multi-namespace mode. You know, I don't know. You know, we haven't really pushed the limits of it yet, or we haven't found the limits, I should say. Um, security, and this is the cool thing about running Postgres in containers, is that you naturally get a certain level of security there, and such that you're in a sandbox environment. Um, and that actually affords you to do, you know, if you want to do some, you know, cooler things like give people super user within your container. And by that I mean Postgres super user, not a not a root within the container. Yeah, you can do that, and there's lower risk to that. Um, you know, I might have my own opinions on what what you should be doing, but the idea is that you know, you know, you, you are operating in more of a sandbox environment, and you know that affords its advantages as well. And you know, just having the process isolation built in too, you know, certainly helps when you're running in a in a multi-tenant environment. Um, and you know, the flexibility, and this is one of the first things that really attracted me to what we were doing with the operator is that. As long as you have a node, you can run it anywhere. You know, it doesn't matter where your OpenShift nodes are deployed. You know, you can run a Postgres cluster there. And that's really cool. And, you know, I think, you know, in, in this regard, like, you know, I, I can, you know, I'll speak for the crunching operator, but the, you know, operators in general create that unified layer where, you know, so long as I have, you know, something that speaks, you know, Kubernetes or OpenShift, you know, I can deploy my workload. Same with if I'm running OpenShift, you know, as long as, you know, I have an OpenShift node somewhere, it doesn't matter what cloud provider I'm on, what hardware I'm running on, you know, I can deploy there. So that's really cool. And, you know, one thing that we do when testing the Postgres operators, we test it, you know, we test in all sorts of places. You know, we run OpenShift in one environment, then OpenShift in another environment. And, you know, for the most part, it just works. So that's, uh, you know, that, that's my pitch for operators in general, you know, let alone the, the Postgres operator. So how does it all work? Um, well, you know, I would say just look at the diagram, but going into a little bit, you know, part of the operator pattern is that you have these things called custom resource definitions. And, you know, from my application developer perspective, I consider that your database schema. Your, your customer resource definitions or CRDs basically, you know, store the infrastructure of what you're going to deploy. So we have one called, uh, PG cluster. 
But PG cluster stores is essentially your definition of your Postgres cluster. You know, it says how many, you know, how many replicas do you want? What port do you want to run it on? Do you want a PG balancer with it? Do you want to collect metrics with it? You know, and so on and so forth. And, you know, from that, you know, PG cluster, you should be able to deploy a Postgres cluster anywhere. If somehow your whole Kubernetes environment gets wiped out, well, well, if your data gets wiped out, then that's a different story. But let's say all your deployments get wiped out. Well, I should be able to redeploy, you know, a Postgres cluster that looks exactly like what you had before <clears throat> from that definition. So from there, what the operator does is the operator reacts to what's been added to a custom resource definition or any changes in the custom resource definition and then applies those changes throughout your OpenShift environment. We've layered a few things on top of that. Um, we have an API server that makes it a little bit easier to interface with uh, the custom resource definitions as it aggregates that information together. And that's actually what the Pico command line client uh, uses as well. Speaking of, we have a command line client called excuse me, Pico, which is, um, I call it the Pico client. <clears throat> it works uh, across different operating systems um, and it makes it you know, super simple to, to create Postgres clusters, manage Postgres clusters, modify them, take backups, you know, whatever it may be, and, you know, and we'll demo some of that. We also have a scheduler, which is used to uh, schedule backups amongst other things. Um, and this is great because you, know, you should always be taking backups. That's another thing I always emphasize that if there's one takeaway from this talk, Please take backups of your Postgres cluster. You know, you never know when you will need them. And maybe to further emphasize that, um, there was a time in my career, like one time where I really had to make a point in time recovery. Like, you know, there was something where we had to, you know, get the data back to a certain point in time and replay it, you know, and you know, find certain things. And thankfully, you know, now that we have backups, you know, we we had our transaction history, you know, back to that point and we were able to, you know, solve the issue. But please take backups. It's so important. So just uh, finishing up, you know, this diagram, um, the most important thing when you're running a database is your storage. Uh, no matter what it is, you know, your storage is going to be your bottleneck. Storage has gotten much faster. Like SSDs were one of the greatest things that happened for, uh, you know, database workloads. You know, the, the one trick with SSDs, particularly back in the day, was reliability. But, you know, you know, the recommendation would be, you know, always have, you know, run in like a RAID 10 mode. Um, so that all said, um, you know, the interesting thing in, you know, the Kubernetes and OpenShift ecosystem are, you know, the variety of storage classes available. Um, or even, you know, people who, you know, we have cases where people just use uh, host path storage and, you know, pin their, you know, Postgres clusters to a single node and, you know, ensure, you know, everything gets right into that node. Um, but, you know, storage selection is, you know, a very, you know, detailed involved topic. Um, the various storage classes have certainly improved, you know, even, you know, even since I started our crunchy data. And, you know, it's interesting to see what's, you know, happening there. Um, our team stays on top of it to, you know, for, for our various testing and, uh, compatibility purposes. But, um, you should always consider, you know, what your, you know, what level of storage you need based upon your workload. Not everyone needs the latest and greatest and most expensive storage for their databases. I mean, you know, am I biased? Like, yes, of course I, you know, I love playing with like the latest and greatest and fastest storage, but, you might not necessarily need that, but if you do, you should know how you're able to, you know, optimize uh, using uh, Postgres, you know, with your various storage layers. So let's talk about high availability, which, you know, was, you know, the, you know, the original topic of this, uh, this chat. This is a really important slide because this explains how high availability works uh, with the Postgres operator, but it also shows like how cool it is. You know, whenever we get tickets about, uh, you know, support tickets around high availability, you know, one thing we always try to ask is, you know, how's your high availability set up in your Kubernetes or your OpenShift environment? Because your Postgres high availability with the Postgres operator is tied to your Kubernetes high availability. And this is a feature, and this is why it's really cool. So Kubernetes and OpenShift are backed by their own distributed consensus storage system. You know, you know, it could be etcd. And, you know, etcd has its own high availability, high availability system built in. But the reason why we leverage this is because it minimizes the amount of Postgres nodes you need to deploy for high availability. So, to, so let's take, you know, the raft algorithm. Now the raft algorithm, algorithm says, you know, you always need an even number, sorry, you always need an odd number of nodes to be able to get high availability. And I believe, you know, as I recall, the recommended number is five. So running five Postgres databases, particularly let's say they're multi-terabyte, you know that's a you know that's a very large footprint. 
even running three, I mean, I, th- I like to recommend three as the number that you should run. But, you know, that's still, if you have, you know, 10 terabytes of data, that's at least 30 terabytes that you need, plus backups, plus, you know, your, you know, your various logs and wall and, you know, other things that you need to store. So this could be a lot of data floating around. By leveraging the, you know, the OpenShift back storage system, you actually only need to run two Postgres instances to get high availability. And that's what's really cool because it does help you lower your footprint, but you can still maintain a safe distributed consensus high availability. So, you know, what I showed here was, you know, I, I just showed three nodes here. And these are the actual OpenShift nodes because you, you know, the other thing you need is a, uh, you know, PG backers repository. Um, you know, that's the third component for the high availability. And the reason you, there's two reasons why we leverage that. One, of course, you need to take backups. Remember, the one takeaway from this talk is please back up your database. Two, uh, PG backups is actually used in the self-healing process. So let's say my primary goes down and, you know, let's say it's down for several minutes. You know, the replica you know, is promoted. We want to bring the primary back into the fold or the old primary. You know, it's going to be a replica, but we need to be able to catch it up to where the primary is so it can you know, rejoin you know, as a healthy streaming replica. We can leverage the PG Backrest uh, Delta Restore feature to efficiently copy the information into uh, you know, the, the failed replica, effectively reprovisioning it, you know, bring it up to speed, and then tie it to, you know, tie back to the, the primary. So, so not only does PG Backus serve as, you know, part of, you know, the disaster recovery system, you know, it does play a role in high availability as well, which is, you know, which is really cool because, you know, we can leverage all, all those efficiencies that are put into it to, you know, quickly heal uh, components within the system. So the takeaway from this is that, you know, the Postgres operator does provide high availability, um, but, you know, it's leveraging, it's leveraging it from, you know, Kubernetes and OpenShift, which, you know, is, like I said, you know, is, is really an advantage. I guess, you know, the other, the other thing I should point out is that the operator itself is not providing the high availability because that would make it a single point of failure. The Postgres instances themselves are providing the high availability. You know, they're communicating with Kubernetes to make sure that, you know, to basically determine, you know, if there needs to be a, uh, a leader election because, you know, a primary is down or unreachable or, you know, whatever it may be. So disaster recovery. So how does it work? I would say that it works in, you know, pretty, you know, in a pretty cool way and in, in what we can support. So we can actually, you know, we, we support a, you know, a multi repository setup. And what I mean by that is that you can push your archives, your backups to, you know, a, you know, a PVC that's somewhere within your, your local OpenShift environment. Or, you know, you can push them to S3 or an S3 compatible storage system, you know, you know such as MinIO. Um, and you can actually support both at once. Um, and yeah, and that's cool. Uh, because, you know, you can guarantee that your backups are being pushed to, to multiple places. Um, additionally, you know, you're able to schedule backups as well. And, you know, the easiest way to make sure you keep taking backups is to keep scheduling them or to have a schedule of them so they can keep uh, being taken. However, you should also make sure your backups are being taken and you should monitor everything else. And, you know, this, this is a feature that, um, you know, that I'm, I'm previewing for, you know, the upcoming operator release that's you know, coming out towards the end of the month is uh, our, our integration with PG Monitor. So what PG Monitor provides is, you know, a series of Grafana dashboards um, that can be, you know, read in from, you know, a Prometheus database. And it basically shows you your overall health of your database. And, you know, it can, you know, it can track things, um, well, it tracks a variety of things. Uh, and probably to go into that is a full talk in itself. But, you know, you know, it's essentially a security list of the key metrics you need to keep an eye on to detect, to try to anticipate issues with your system. Or, you know, that will give you the overall health of your system. So, for instance, if you're supposed to take, you know, you know, daily backups and the backup's not taken, you know, that, you know, the, the top bar that you see on the screen is going to go uh, red. Uh, you can drill it down to your specific databases or specific pods within your cluster. Um, but, you know, the idea is that, you know, you have all these key metrics there. Take another one, replication status. Uh, this helps you detect, you know, what your replication lag is. Um, if you're using asynchronous replication, you know, this will be, this could become an issue because if your lag is too much, you know, you have, you're at risk for data loss if there's a, a failover event. Um, so, you know, you do want to keep an eye on that. 
the, you know, the other thing, the other thing with this is that, you know, this works with, you know, all, all the upstream components. So, you know, if you already have a Prometheus instance that's, uh, you know, set up that you're using to aggregate your metrics, you know, you can plug in the, the Grafana dashboards and, you know, be able to pull from that Prometheus instance. One of the dashboards that uh, I want to show is actually related to getting pod specific metrics. So this was an issue that we had run into for a long time was that, you know, some of the key metrics when uh, using a Postgres database are related to your actual pod utilization. And, you know, we had a hard time trying to pull these metrics out in a consistent way. Um, you know, one of the people at Crunchy Data, Joe Conway, you know, he's a Postgres committer, major contributor, um, you know, you know, and, you know, now a uh, container enthusiast wrote an extension to Postgres called PG Node MX that can actually reach inside the pod and uh, pull the information out of the various uh, C groups. And it works for C groups version one and, and version two. And it can pull out, you know, the specific, you know, let's call them the OS style metrics um, from that particular pod. So I can see, oh, you know, this, you know, primary is used, has as much disk activity or, you know, it's currently, you know, CPU is currently pegged out 100% of it. Do I need to raise the limit? Um, and help answer questions like that. And this is, this is probably, you know, you're not supposed to pick favorite features, but this is the feature I'm most excited for for the for the upcoming release because, uh, particularly you know as an app, excuse me as an application developer, um, you know this you know this is this is where I always started to when troubleshooting my systems because to me they were the stats that made the most sense. If memory utilization is getting out of control, you know I knew that you know there's probably you know there there might be a runaway query and I should look into that. Same thing with like, you know, CPU is at 100%. Let me try to find the process that's doing that. Oh, maybe it's a really poor recursive query I ran, which was often the case. You know, I could then go in and fix it. I mean, kill the process and then fix it. But um, yeah, disk usage, you know, oh, I'm at like 80% disk usage. You know, is there an unacknowledged replication slot somewhere that's, you know, causing, you know, too many wall logs to be retained? And of course, you know, it's nice to be able to look at the charts and get all of this kind of, all of this information, but it's also good to be alerted to problems. And uh, we've pulled together our favorite alerts that will tell you, you know, uh, you know, what kind of errors are going on. You know, if, for instance, if high availability is, you know, if, if you can't heal something, you know, something's wrong, the cluster is inaccessible and it's inaccessible for a certain period of time. Um, you now let's, you know, let's send a critical alert for that. The way I triggered this alert originally was I, uh, I did a, a very terrible thing. I removed the data directory from Postgres and just like totally made it, made the instance unusable. And that was good enough to trigger the alert. I was actually not running it as a high availability uh, instance, which is why, uh, it, uh, was impossible to heal. Um, so. That being said, uh, you know, we, you know, we've added a variety of alerts, you know, is, is your disk filling up? Um, is a replica, is a replica, you know, is it lagging too far behind you know, and so on and so forth. And, you know, we hopefully, you know, you find these useful and I hope you never have to respond to one of those alerts. So um, last but not least, in terms of, you know, the walkthrough demo, and then we'll try, you know, a live demo. Um, you know, adding the ability to administrate your database from a, uh, a user interface, in this case, a PG admin. Uh, we actually did a, we actually created an integration where, you know, you know, we're able to tie the Postgres user accounts to PG admin and keep them all in sync. So that way you can log into your PG you know, admin data, uh, PG admin instance and, you know, administrate your Postgres database. So, you know, we, we, we tried to check all the boxes in terms of not only having the, the day two administration options available, make it very easy for the people who do the, the daily Postgres work to be able to interface with their database. So let's do this. Let's create, you know, this, you know, high availability cluster with monitoring and connection pooling and, you know, all these wonderful things with one command, because that, that's really the beauty of all of it. So first off, I went ahead. Um, I created a Postgres cluster because I think we're going to do um, have some fun. So let's see. So we have a so we have a Postgres cluster. Um, let's uh, inspect it a bit. So first off, uh, Pico. Pico's you know we call it the the command line client for um, you know, for interfacing with the Postgres operator. I mean you can interface with the uh, custom resource definitions directly. We find this very useful um, to to use the command line client. And you know there's a bunch of different things. Uh, for instance, I can test if uh, my cluster is up. 
I can see the, the current disk utilization. Um, I can scale it. Well, first I can, I can introspect it. I can, I can check on the health of my backups. I take another backup, because why not? And I can, I can scale it up. So yeah, so so the Pico so the Pico client is you can see is a Swiss Army knife for uh, being able to uh, handle you know all these different uh, operations within uh, you know your your daily Postgres environment. So while that's going on, to show there's nothing up my sleeve. Um, I had created, I had also created a PG Bouncer, which I've been connecting to. Um, here it is. And I, I have a port forward set up to it. You don't need to worry about reading the screen since it's just a port forward. I've also been, I also uh, added some data to my Postgres database to, um, you know, to basically bootstrap it using, you know, a, a tool called uh, PG Bench. So what I'm going to do is I am going to start uh, writing data to my database using PG Bench. And I will also say this is truly a live demo because I'm going to do something I did not test beforehand, but I want to see if it works. Hey, right. Jonathan, so, how often, how often does a live demo actually break on you? So typically I rehearse them, so the probability is very small. Um, this is uh, this is uncharted territory, but in this case, I'm going to try to purposely break it. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to kill the primary node while we're running uh, PG Bench, and we're going to see what happens. So let me find first off, let me find an available terminal window where I can do it. I realize the font's probably really small here, but what I'm going to do is. I'm going to run a delete on the primary node. Look at that. So clearly we have the server connection crash, but it reconnected just like that. So yeah, I'm going to I'm going to put this into the background so it keeps running. So so what's going on? So let's do a, a test on Hippo. So we can see that you know our you know our primary and PG bouncer are up, um, and we you know the original primary was this node, the hippo blah 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 blah. The new primary is hippo acgj. So so the high availability worked that you know we quickly um, you know even even though we deleted the pod, which you know things can happen in in Coop world, sorry, in OpenShift world, so maybe the pod does get you know rescheduled or deleted, but it came back up. The interruption was very minimal. Um, that's pretty cool. That's you, know, you can't can't get much better with high availability on that regard. Um, again, you know what I mentioned earlier is that if you want to avoid transaction loss, um, you need to have synchronous replication set up, which is something that you know we do support from the uh, the Postgres operator. Here, let me stop PG Pinch because those messages are getting tiring. If I want to create a cluster with synchronous replication. I would use the uh, sync replication flag. Now, I mentioned that I talk about the trade off of that. Uh, the problem with synchronous replication as it stands today is that um, if your replica goes down, so not your primary, if your replica goes down, technically your primary goes down because you need to guarantee that your rights are getting to the replica. Now, with Postgres 10 and beyond, this is solved with core and commit. And I believe, you know, I haven't tried it myself, but if you do some of the, you know, advanced configuration with, you know, a Postgres operator instance, you can probably get the quorum commit. Um, I, I would also caveat your mileage may vary, but the quorum commit, you know, you can make it a little, a little safer to deal with uh, synchronous replication in the sense of that, you know, there's still like the performance penalty. Of, I mean, Sorry, there isn't like that. There is a performance penalty still using it because you need to guarantee that your rights get to, Whatever, you know, number of Postgres instances that there are. But, um, you know, it's not, it's not necessarily going to cause, you know, you know, a downtime, much like if just a single replica goes down, your primary goes down. 
Um, but that said, if you, you know, there, there's certainly workloads that need it and, you know, you're willing to pay the performance hit because you're guaranteeing that your rights are going to be in multiple places. I'd also say, you know, leveraging PG backers the way we do does, you know, help ensure that your rights get, you know, pushed out to, you know, the, the back repository as well. Um, you know, there, there's always a little bit of a delay because you're dealing, you know, you need your full write ahead live record written, uh, written before, you know, it goes out there. Some of the other things that, uh, that are, that are cool about this, um, other than, uh, showing that high availability actually works is, um, let me see if I can create a P, uh, PG admin. So, so it'll take a few minutes to come up, but, you know, we'll try directly logging into the database you know, via uh, PG Admin if I'm able to get all my commands correct, because, again, uncharted territory. You know, maybe, you know, maybe to cover a couple of the other cool features, um, you know, you're able to tune your memory settings, you know, tune, you know, how much, you know, CPU or RAM you want for a particular node. You know, if you decide that, you know, what you originally, you know, deployed your cluster with is not um, sufficient enough, you know, you can update it later. Uh, what else can you do? Uh, you can add table spaces. Uh, table spaces are good if you want, you know, th th there's a variety of reasons where you'd want to use a table space. So a table space is an additional external volume that you're attaching to your Postgres instance, um, you know, for multiple purposes. One, it might just be a very large table that, or a very large group of tables, or a very large database that you don't want to attach to your main uh, Postgres data directory. It could be that, you know, you want to take advantage of, you know, super fast storage for, you know, a particular data set. It could be that you just have a lot of data and you need to, you know, spread it out amongst multiple PVCs. You know, I don't, you know, it, the use cases do vary. Um, so, you know, you're able to, you know, add table spaces to, uh, you know, operator Postgres clusters, operator managed Postgres clusters. You set the size of the PVC that you want. Um, you could do that on a one-off basis. Um, do other cool things. As you can see, there's a lot of flags. I do encourage you to read the documentation. Um, I've tried to write the documentation in a way that tells a story that gets you going to where you need to go. Um, as always, because it's open source, patches are welcome. You know, people certainly do like to leave their opinions on the documentation. Uh, we also support an easy way of setting up uh, TLS connections. You know, th this is, you know, probably I only lightly touched upon this earlier. Um, TLS, of course, is a very important part of uh, you know, being able to, you know, encrypt, uh, you know, encrypting communications, make sure people aren't eavesdropping. Uh, we try to make it as easy as possible. Uh, you just have to provide, you know, a, you know, a key cert pair and you know, you're good to go. You can force, you can, and you can also force all connections to be able to TLS by using, uh, the TLS only option. So I've probably stalled, I hope, long enough. Uh, there should be a PG admin deployed. There is. Let me see if I can port forward to it. So. Cool. So, one moment. I'm going to see, make sure I actually the port forward correctly to my computer. Yep. Alrighty. So now I'm going to shift my screen one more time, or maybe two more times. All right. So this is PG Admin. Um, it's, uh, you know, as I mentioned, it's a popular user interface for interfacing with Postgres. So I'm going to create a new user. Call the user Hippo. And voila. So this is cool because, you know, this syncs with the administrative dashboard. Um, I can, you know, very easily log into my databases and see, uh, at which one I, uh, ran those, uh, you know, the, the PG bench tool on. Mostly because I want to be able to, uh, run some queries against it, but I forget where I ran it.
here we go. All right. So, um, yeah, so here's, uh, here's, uh, the, uh, here's all of our data. Try to, we could try to query against it. Or I'll probably, you no, know, because I don't remember the syntax, you know, I can create a table right here. Insert some data. Then query it. And just like that. And, you know, again, you know, what was really nice is that, you know, I was able to, you know, run a command on the operator and then, you know, have everything, you know, synchronized into the PG admin interface. So, you know, it's, it's, it's these things that are convenient and it's, you know, creating ways of, you know, systematically being able to, um, you know, to be able to, you know, you know, manage a whole wide variety of different, uh, Postgres workloads and needs. So I think with that, um, I will return to the slides. So first, uh, we saw, we actually saw this whole thing created. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's really, you know, that's really all I have. I can, you know, try to go ahead and, you know, do more live demos, see if, uh, see if I can actually break myself. Um, if I try to deploy the monitoring suite, I will break myself because I found something, you know, incorrect in my configuration. I stopped and figured it quite exactly figured out what it is, but if I can get that working, it's actually pretty cool to see all, all the charts and dials, uh, going. But yeah, I think with that, I'm, you know, I'm happy, happy to take questions. Hey, Jonathan, it's Mike here from Red Hat. How are you? Um, hey, Mike, how are you doing? I, I'm doing really well. I, I, uh, in, interesting demo. It's always, it's always good to see, see the inner workings of something so cool. Um, but, you know, I, I manage relationships with lots and lots of software partners here at Red Hat, and it seems like there's just database vendors coming out of the woodwork everywhere. Are they all the same? Meaning, like, how is how is Crunchy uniquely positioned out there to be better than the other ten database vendors that are, that are all popping up everywhere? Yeah. So you know, look, there's 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 all sorts of different solutions out there to you know the how do I store my data, and you know it's certainly something I've seen through the years. Um, and again, you know, I, you know, I, you know, I'm biased. I've been using Postgres for 15 years. I've deploy, been deploying it successfully in production in fi for 15 years. Deployed, I know, I was running Postgres, you know, even before there was replication or like any high availability guarantees. And you know, I think you know one thing that you know I love about it is that you know it's it's a very strong and healthy open source community. It's, you know, similar to the way you know Linux is, similar to the way Kubernetes is, and you know, one thing that I've, I've liked at Crunchy is, you know, we, you know, we have adopted the Red Hat model and, you know, we found, you know, and we find that, you know, you know, we like the fact that everything we do is open source and we're able to support open source that, you know, we can make the upstream, you know, the best stream, so to speak. So I think, you know, you know, what, you know, what I like about Crunchy is, you know, beyond that, it's, you know, how we do focus on, you know, what I said in this original slide, you know, beyond open source, it's, you know, adapting to the modern technologies that are out there, ensuring that, you know, we continue to make Postgres work, you know, efficiently on OpenShift and, you know, the focus on security, you know, a lot, a lot of what I found with data security through the years is that, you know, everyone wants it, but they really only employ it, you know, to, you know, to ensure that they're um, compliant with whatever regulations that they are. And if you find that you're not doing things to you know, keep your data safe and secure, you can actually run to, you know, a PR nightmare when, you know, data is breached. And, you know, data security is a whole topic in itself. You know, we probably spend, you know, several hours on it. And I think, you know, one thing that, you know, we try to focus on is not only how to mitigate the risk of threat, but, you know, how to deal with, you know, what happens, you know, should there should there be a breach and ensuring that you can minimize, you know, the overall damage of that. So, you know, that's, you know, that's what I'd love that's what I like to say about Postgres and Crunchy. It's, you know, the fact that, you know, you know, we love the upstream and, you know, that's, you know, that's what we want to support. Thanks. Uh, I, I got one other question, the completely other side of the, of, of the, of the table though. Crunchy okay. data. Where yeah. did you guys yeah. come up? Where'd you guys come up with it? We always hear lots of interesting stories about how different companies select their name and, you know, the, the, the hidden yeah. meanings of why, uh, of the name and so forth. But, but why, why Crunchy, why Crunchy data? So interesting. I thought I thought you would have asked about the hippo because I think that's you know that's the the bigger urban legend. Well, that's, I, so, I think that's that's part of it. It's like you know, there, it, is, is a hippo crunchy? <laughs> what, how does that work? Yeah. So so there's many so there's many uh, urban legends around this. Um, 
I'll, uh, you know, I think, you know, crunchy data actually came out of a meeting where uh, someone uh, described, you know, what uh, our founders are working on as very crunchy. So uh, that's, uh, you know, that, you know, maybe maybe the urban legend for that's a little less, but the hippo has many stories. Um, and, you know, the one that I choose to believe is that, uh, you know, hippo, you know, hippos are, you know, fiercely protective of their bordering hole. And you know, given Crunchy's data roots are in you know the security space, you know having you know having an animal that is you know very protective of you know your core asset, you know the watering hole, your data lake, if you will, um, you know you know, gives a strong you know sense of assurance that you know we're looking after the integrity and safety of your data. You know an- another one that I heard is that you know a hippo, you know when you see a hippo in the water, you know you only see its eyes, but you know there's a whole lot going on underneath the water and you know that's sort of you know like a principle of security is that you might only see one layer but you know there's a lot of other layers going on um there's at least five other urban legends i've heard around the name uh but you know those those are the two that i particularly like gotcha okay so what's next what do you uh i I know we're we're just about out of time um how, how do people get in touch with you i mean do they Send an email to Jonathan yeah. or, you know, call your house phone. Yeah. yeah uh, well, we, fortunately, as you can you know, see by, oh, I don't know if it's still sharing my kitchen or not. Uh, we're fortunate that that house phone is, does not, is not actually connected to an outside line. But, yeah, email me, um, you know, jonathan.cats at crunchydata.com. You Twitter me at jcat05. Um, go to the website, crunchydata.com, see what we're doing. Um, plenty of people come to uh, the actual GitHub repo, uh, uh, crunchy data slash Postgres dash operator. Uh, so we get a slew of questions there. But yeah, you know that's the you know that's the easiest to to what's next if you want to get in touch. Okay, and, and, and there was and also, one, there, there was another question, Jonathan. Just I know, sorry, we're over time, but um, hey, go for it. CRD. Yeah. Shannon was asking about, you know, can you share your CR by any chance? And, and I was like, I don't, I'm not sure what CR is, but Shannon just, it's the, it's the, uh, the is what the, uh, it's what you use to create the actual pods. Yeah. So the C, so all this is in the documentation. We have a section just on the custom resource. Um, So yeah, the, CR, so the CRD is the definition itself. We actually, we uh, in our documentation, we have examples of how you can create uh, custom resources. If you, I mean, if you, I could show what one looks like real quick, uh, one that's already created. Yeah, sorry. Uh, if you have just the YAML, it's fine. Just kind of um, for the learning purpose uh, to spin it up, it's kind of easier to have a sample. Um, when you mentioned that uh, documentation is at the access.crunchydata.com document, right? Um, it is. Oh, the, the GitHub one. It's the GitHub one. The well, the, well, in GitHub, well, in Git, well, GitHub, it's it's in the access.crunchydata.com documentation. Okay. Yeah, I found that GitHub one and points it to the Crunchy data, but I would just kind of want to get a quick start and grab your CR, and then I can just pop them on in and try. Yeah. Yeah. So, so this is so this is an example CR. This is uh, the cluster that I was demoing from. And it is in the uh, GitHub. What you what you saying? Correct. Well, the correct. We it's in our documentation. So we so we have an example for how you can create a Postgres cluster uh, using a custom resource. Okay. You know, one one of the reasons why we have the command line is you know it makes it a little bit easier. Um, you know, it's much easier to type pico create cluster hippo than you know, fill out the CR. But that said, you know, we do we do provide examples for how to do it. Uh, from you know using just the, the the custom resource. Okay, cool. Thank you. Welcome. All right then. I think we we came to the end of our hour here, and uh, it was a bit of a tour de force, and and I really appreciate that. Uh, so thank you so much, Jonathan. We'll have 
crunchy back again in uh, a little bit of time. Uh, I think next month uh, we'll have some of the folks doing some spatial GIS, but this has been an awesome session. So thanks, Michael, cool. again, for arranging this, and Jonathan, for sharing your kitchen with us. Yep, uh, happy, happy to invite people into our kitchen, but we can only fit so many.